Michelle. I'd like to send a shout out to Rick for being our technology lead today. Thank you so much, Rick. For over 50 years, UUFP has been a liberal religious voice in Boston. We believe that faith and facts are not an either or proposition. We believe that we can and should honor the wisdom of those who went before us, even as we acknowledge that the past doesn't have all the answers. And if we don't learn from the past, we're doomed to repeat it. We believe there are still plenty of questions to explore. And most of all, we believe that everyone is inside the circle. I usually say that as no one is outside, but really, when you think about saying no one is outside, at least you think about the outside, when really, we want to make sure everyone feels inside. Everyone is inside that circle of love and compassion. So we hope that your spirit and your heart and your mind are refreshed as we gather here today. We gather this Sunday morning and every Sunday morning, not because we share a creed, but because we share a promise. A promise to support one another on our spiritual journey. Our services are very different each week, but the community here remains the same. So whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you're from, we are so glad you made the choice to be with us today. Now we have time for announcements. If you have an announcement to share, please come on forward. Please use one of the microphones so everyone can hear you and please introduce yourself so everybody remembers your name. Hi, I'm gonna make sure you remember your own. Um, I talked to Lisa Tokyo, um, which we be happy to do every once in a while to make sure we're all together on our Sunday stuff. And uh, Reverend Dave the First, uh, Dave Barrington, uh, has fought, he's fallen a couple of times, he's in rehab, so I've got a get well card from for him. So those of you who remember Reverend Dave, uh, he, he's actually the reason we have that lovely challenge. Well, he gave that to us. So um, anyway, I'll have it out at the picnic. And second thing, I'll be announcing who won the, uh, the sign contest. I'm Miranda, and this is the last Sunday that I can give you the list of things that you can put in the basket for the cluster for June. Um, the school bins that we're going to make for the children. Um, the cluster, if you don't know, folks, people too, are challenged in terms of having home. I will not fool you. Um, so here we go. They're collecting school supplies and Here's the list. Binders, calculators, color pencil, composition books, crayons, erasers, folders, glue, glue stick, highlighters, index cards, markers, pencils, pencil cases, pens, rulers, and spiral notebooks. Now, um, do we meet next week? There's no, we're not meeting next week for a Sunday service. So you can't bring them on Sunday. Um, but if you are near and drop by or there's another time, if you know someone with a key or if you have a key, you can get in here and drop the things off and I'll see to it that they get to the cluster. Um, I think that the date at the cluster is the 3rd of June. So that's the deadline for these things. So go nowhere. It's a big basket in the foyer, but right beside the kitchen door. Lots of space in it right now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda. Um, I just want to um, announce or remind that on Sunday, June 11th, we will be holding our annual congregational meeting um, after the Sunday services. So usually if we give people enough time to grab a cup of coffee, a snack, um, and come back in here. All are welcome to attend. Um, the only individuals who can vote though are members. And this is an important meeting because we will review the past year that we've had. We will vote on this is democracy in action. This is where we vote on your leaders, um, the board of directors. Uh, we will also discuss and vote on a budget. Um, so this is where members have a point of view in terms of how 
we want to spend the money that we have. So it's a really important meeting and I encourage you, if you can, please attend. We will be running it via Zoom. So even if you can't make it that day, um, you can certainly Zoom in and if you are a member, your vote will count. All right, if you have any questions, please ask myself or any other board member. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kay. Um, I'm going to make an announcement. I think there's probably only one person here that doesn't know we're at the picnic today. <laughs> so uh, we're having a picnic in one of you today. And uh, thank you, everybody, for great stuff that you can come and enjoy the food and the camaraderie and not bring something. So please stay. One person over there that <laughs> might not know. Um, anyway, um, Beautiful day. There are leftover containers in there. So when we have a lot of stuff left over, let's just part it out and everything is gone by the end of the day. Okay. All right. Thanks. Team kitchen at the end. That's the that goal. Everybody take something home. And then the thing about um, the cluster. I don't know if any of you have had the fortune, good fortune to have you watch Bubble Guppies. It's a Nickelodeon's TV show for children. Um, they did, every time I hear the word pencil case, I think about the Lady Gaga cover they did instead of poker face, uh, pencil case. My, 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 my pencil case. <laughs> oh yeah, the things that go through my head. Okay. So. Now is the time to light our chalice. We'll light our chalice. Um, Henry's going to get up and light the chalice for us. Thank you so much for volunteering, Henry, for being volunteer, whichever. <laughs> we light our chalice this morning with the words of Jordan B. McKinnon. Or Jordan, sorry, Jordan B. McKinnon. I have this book right here, but I still read it wrong. It says, Deep calls unto deep. Joy calls unto joy, light calls unto light. Let the kindling of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of love, peace, and hope. As one flame lights another, it does not grow any less. And we pledge ourselves to be the bearers of light wherever we are. Thank you so much. <laughs> So that same technology that helps to make the far flung corners of the world feel closer, and that helps us to connect to people and places we might not otherwise know, can also distract us from the place where we are here and now today. So now is the time in our service where I ask you to disconnect from the outside world just for this sacred time. Put your phone on silent, close your eyes, to feel the weight of your body in your chair. Take a second to notice your breath and how breathing in makes the energy flow through your body. And then you can listen to the sound of the chime. Our opening words this morning come from Evan Carvel Zimmer. He says, if we lived in another climate, our souls might speak other languages. We might speak oasis or permafrost or dry season or monsoon, but our souls speak spring. Our souls speak green shoots pushing through last year's leaves. Our souls speak flower buds stretching towards the sun. Our souls speak mud puddle and nest building and damp earth and worm casing. I need green leaves and frog choruses. 
He speaks spring because spring sings in us. We gather to nurture our faith in our own growing, our own courage to push through, our own blossoming in beauty, our own small part in the spring of this world. Come, let us worship together. Now it's time for our first hymn, Oh, Give Us Pleasure in the Day of Our Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I can hold the hand. Can you guys all hear me? Everybody is very excited about this book. Um, so since today we're talking about possibility and the exciting spring and what's to come. We decided to pick this book. It's called What Do You Do with a Chance? We read that book. You too. Right? You know, the little boy does. <laughs> it fluttered around me. It brushed up against me. It circled me as if it wanted me to grab it. I started to reach for it, and I was unsure and pulled back. So it flew away. You guys see? What is flying away? From the butterfly, yeah. See the yellow? Okay, like a folded, really good worm on me. Yeah. Is it a little bit? The chicken. So it flew away. I thought about it a lot. <clears throat> I wish I had taken my chance. I realized that I wanted it, but I still didn't know if I had the courage. There he is. Thank you. There's a the chance. Can you turn it down? Yeah, there it is. Thank you. 
When another chair came around, I wasn't so sure, but I decided to try. As another chance came back, and then, there it goes. I went to reach for it, but I missed it and fell. I was embarrassed. I felt foolish. It seemed like everyone was looking at me, and I decided I never wanted to feel that way again. So he took. He went for the chance, and then he didn't get it. Have you guys ever felt that way? You tried something, yeah. <laughs> So after that, whenever a chance came along, I ignored it. <laughs> and the moment, the, and the more I ignored them, the less they came around. So there was no more. Hey, okay. you want to say anything? Yeah, there he is. Until one day I noticed I hadn't seen a chance in quite a while. And it was as if they had all disappeared. I started to worry. What if I don't get another chance? I know I acted like I didn't care, but the truth was I did. I still wanted to take a chance, but I was afraid and I wasn't sure if I would ever be brave enough. Then I thought maybe I would have to be brave all the time. Maybe I just need to be brave for a little while. At the right time, I realized it was up to me. I promised myself that if I ever got another chance, I wasn't going to pull back. If I got another chance, I was going to be ready. Then one day, the then one seemingly ordinary day, I saw something shining off in the distance. Is it possible? I hoped. Could this be my chance? Do you see it up in the distance? What do you think he's going to have to do to get that? Jump. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. It's fun. Jumping can be scary, right? Let's be brave. I had to find out. I ran as hard and fast as I could towards it. I don't know how to explain it, but the second I let go of my fears, I was full of excitement. You know, sometimes when we feel nervous, can you sit down? <laughs> sometimes when we feel nervous, it's just excitement bottled up. Great. Sit down. Okay. It wasn't that I was no longer afraid, but now my excitement was bigger than my fear. Oh. <laughs> there you go. As I got closer, I could see that it was a really, really huge chance. Oh my gosh. And do you think he could like ride that chance? I think it's like a plane. Yeah. That's what he's doing. I'm good to snort and fly and to be free. I know. And now and now I see that I'm held back. I miss it. And I don't want to miss it. It's just so much I want to see and do and discover. That chance. You didn't care what people thought, right? So what do you do with a chance? You take it. Because it just might be the start of something incredible. Here he is. Look, look he got to go there because he took that chance, right? So that's the end of the story. And we're going to talk more about chances of education, OK? I feel like you that too. Grab the baskets. We all know what that means. 
Now it is time for the morning offering. Thank you. Reverend Heather Christensen wrote the New World's Weekly Guide for the Unitarian Universalist blog for almost 10 years. So she has a unique perspective on our faith tradition because it was her job to read through what people in our faith tradition were, were writing about and then tell us all which blogs to read, which, which things were interesting. And in her words for the offering, she writes, Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision of a world filled with peace and justice and love and joy. This vision is embodied in a few large congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations, and many, many small congregations. But no matter its size, every congregation depends on its members. And we're just like that. We're a congregation that depends on its members. We depend on each one of you. We depend on each one of you choosing to be here and choosing to say yes. Yes to the mission that we support and yes to this community that we love. So this morning, the offering is being taken with such joy and it's being received with such gratitude. Okay, well, now I guess we got to my meeting, the truck driver. It's by Gordon D. McKeenan. I didn't get the name wrong this time. Go me. And oh, actually, it's not the truck driver because you know what I was doing? I was reading through this whole book as I was sitting right here. And I was like, yeah, the truck driver, that works for today. Okay, that's perfect. And then I came across a different one called The Common Day. And I was like, oh, wait, no, this one's bad. <laughs> so we're going to listen to The Common Day. A decade ago, actually, it was more than a decade ago, because he wrote this book about a decade ago. So two decades ago, Jap Japanese Emperor Hirohito died, and there was much speculation about his role in World War II. I wondered then, and actually I wondered too, and I wonder occasionally, even now, what his life must have been like. He didn't choose to be emperor. It was an accident of birth, a hereditary position. All accounts of his life describe him as retiring and shy, at most home in a biological laboratory studying various marine species. He wrote several books about the subject. As emperor, he had very little actual power, but enormous symbolic power. He took actual power only once after the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When Japan's military leaders disagreed about continuing the war, he decreed a surrender. He said once that his fondest dream was to live just one day as a common person. That was his fondest dream. You know, most of us are living the emperor's dream every day. It may never occur to us that we are the daily recipient of what the emperor could only vainly hope a day is a common person, a common day replete with common things, things we take for granted, like sleeping and waking again to a new day, performing our simple chores, like dressing and making the bed, eating breakfast, reading or seeing the world's new terrors and torments and tragedies and triumphs, doing ordinary work, whose impact is largely unfathomable, but we'd be missed by someone if it were not done laundry, the cleaning, the meal preparation, looking out upon the ordinary world, breathing the air, drinking the water, enjoying the children at play, marveling at the beauty of the flowers, the vastness of the sky, the gutsy heroism of simple folk, remembering loved ones near and far, those who have been our teachers, our companions, our acquaintances, our benefactors, our beneficiaries, our neighbors, even our ancestors, who by and large lived through common days themselves, mostly hard, but occasionally tolerable or easy. <clears throat> Calling to mind those who bequeath the color and fragrance and texture for each common day. Recalling the vast fabric of love and labor performed night and day by those unknown to us who make our lives easier a thousand more unmentioned blessings. 
One who finds so many wonders and beneficences in a common day understands deeply the line uttered by Emily in Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you, followed by the anguished question. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute? So today is one common day, one more chance to be fully alive. Welcome. And let's see. So now I believe we are in the number of minutes. 195. Okay, I'm going to give you a little warning about hitting number 195. Um, we all know I have this pension for picking random hints that I think are really cool because we never talk about them. These have, this one has words by Longfellow. And the tune is a Taiwanese folk tune. I'm sorry, Robert. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, that's the one I was thinking of. Robert Louis Stevenson. But the the tune is a Taiwanese folk song, so the melody is going to be really hard for us to follow because it's not the natural hymn kind of melody. But we're going to do our best, and we're going to love it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Expressing them. Right, expressing them because, okay, I don't know if you've ever had a teacher correct you when you say, Can I go to the bathroom? You know, like, well, I'm certainly going to Okay, okay. Parents do that too. Um, so that's what made me think of expressing possibility. There's the possibility that you may or may not be able to leave the room, there's the possibility that you may or may not need and a chance that you have. Well, May is out possibility. I can't believe that it is already May. They tell you that your experience of time speeds up as you get older. And I remember how long summer seemed when I was a kid. It seemed like, you know, school would end and then there would be these golden, long, endless days where I could wander down to the library or to the community pool or sit on my porch or sit in my own backyard in the swing. And it was just forever. And now it's like, oh my goodness, the kids are already going back to school. Why did 
Can we just end it? I don't feel like the possibilities are endless these days. And my kids aren't growing up with the freedom to wander that I need. In part, it's because where I lived, we had sidewalks. So you could let your child walk someplace. I think my kids don't have sidewalks. They're, the only place they can walk to is a Wawa a mile down the road, and I won't let them walk there because they have to cross two busy streets to get there. And my street is a double line street, so there's no walking. Like, you can't even walk to the bus stop because the school bus won't, like, they don't want you to walk on a not sidewalk, so they'll stop directly in front of your house. I mean, I would have loved that when I was a kid. I'd walk all the way down to the end of the block. It was like, you know, a whole quarter mile was possible. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> for myself, I feel like the endless things today are not the possibilities, but the to-do list. The laundry, the dishes, trimming the roses so they don't eat the visitors to my house. Um, and literally my roses this year just grew across the door like we lived in Sleeping Beauty's house. <laughs> this year I've had to plan the summer camps and the thankathons and the dentist appointments. And the possibilities I see are mostly possible failures and forgetting to possibly miss a checkbox and have a catastrophe in the fall. That's not what spring's about, right? Spring's not about waiting for fall. Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, I still remember when the encyclopedia was like a large thing of books that you had to go to the reference section of the library. You guys remember that? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyhow, the Encyclopedia Britannica says that the month of May is named after the Roman fertility goddess Maya. And Wikipedia says Maya is a Greek goddess and not a Roman goddess. She was the oldest of the Pleiades. The seven sister nymphs were companions to Artemis, the goddess of Hunt. And she was also the mother of Hermes, the god of messengers. So in the Roman pantheon, when everything got Latinized, she got kind of um, put in with Terra and Gaia and a whole bunch of other things to become a goddess of growth and new things springing up. And it's an apt association for a month where the grass seems to grow endlessly. It's shaggy like the day after my husband goes. I don't understand. So we think of January as the month for personal growth, even though May is the month for everything else to grow. But May, January is when we say, okay, well, we have to really buckle down and do it this year. The new year is the time to start fresh. It's the artificial border that we place around our days. And it feels good when we can start at day one with a brand new habit. And then check off that habit in your to-do list every day after that going forward. That is every day until you miss the first one. Uh-oh, what happens then? Okay, so if you're really committed, you may keep going with a new habit any, anyhow. Like, for example, my phone has um, inside, there's an app that I do to learn languages, and it has a freeze. So, oh, you didn't forget, it was just a street free. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everyone's off once in a while. But if you're not so sure, or if your app is not so forgiving and doesn't give you that streak of freeze, then your change might have been hard and the old habit might have been easier. Well, starting over again to get a new whole big streak might feel a little too big. And you might not even really be starting over. You're just picking up something you were doing just two days ago, but it just feels so big. It feels like you're starting brand new. That gap felt like the end. And the temptation may be to wait until a new beginning to try again. Hey, better luck next year. Why do we do that? Why do we feel like a new beginning has to come at a particular beginning point? And why is that point midwinter? I mean, sure, it's the return of light and some incremental gains of minutes at a time, but most of us don't notice that growing of the light any more than we notice the growing of our hair or our fingernails until it's time for a trim. So why don't we begin again in May? May with its new flowers and its new growth and its new beginnings, it seems like an ideal time to imagine new ways of being. 
And maybe we don't need to pick up our old resolutions. After all, New Year's resolutions are kind of perennials and not annuals. They grow up the same ones every year. We choose something we think we ought to feel bad about and we fix it, whether or not it really causes a problem in our lives. I was listening to Marty Moskowain's new show, The Connection, this Friday, and she was speaking to neuropsychologist David Noel, who works with neurodiverse people with attention deficit hyperactivity, and you know, you know how it's normally called ADHD with disorder at the end. He was making the point that it's not a disorder unless it actually makes your life difficult. And there are some really good things that you can get out of having like a lot of different things that you're interested in and a lot of energy to get those things done. And he also points out that things that feel like hyperactivity, a lot of fidgeting, that might just be a way to burn off all of that energy that you have to spend by sitting quietly doing things that are not natural to your own self. And if you're engaged in something that is natural to yourself, that, that energy is a bonus. Different doesn't necessarily mean bad. So ADHD should be like attention deficit, hyperactivity, I don't know, display, difference, trait. It's not necessarily a disorder. One of the things that makes humans a successful species is our creativity and our drive to explore. And these are aspects that are heightened in people whose brains display ADHD. And the other thing that I took away from this conversation was that there are several ways to approach a difficulty. So Noel was talking about helping his clients find solutions so that they can live their lives in the best, most fulfilling way possible. So one of the things he was talking about is sometimes people have difficulty with remembering rote tasks because they're boring. And powering through a boring task, that's, that's a difficult thing to do. So he was talking about there are top-down solutions to try to power through, and then there are bottom-up solutions. Top-down solutions are techniques to brute force or muscle your way into having a habit. So his example was, if you have a really tough time remembering to pay your bills, then a top-down solution is you set reminders on your calendar for the days that your bills are due. And then you give yourself a mini reward if you actually filled out all that paperwork and got all those bills done. You're forcing yourself to do it, even though it feels awful. A bottom-up solution, though, is a way out. Instead of coming up with a solution to force yourself to do something that feels awful, what can you do to make it feel effortless? So a bottom-up solution for your bills, that would be, okay, I'm just going to set my bills to go automatically. Oh, I don't have to worry about setting the calendar reminder and like filling out all the paperwork and making sure it's done on time. It just happens. Oh, there you go. I don't have to think about it. It's done. If you hate doing taxes and you love planting flowers, why not find your neighbor who's a tax attorney and plant their flowers while they do your taxes? Bottom up solution. <laughs> if you hate planning your dinners, how about Hello Fresh or Blue Apron to plan for you? An example for my own life is vacuuming. It is really hard for me to muscle my way through vacuuming. I have a lot of pets and if my vacuuming doesn't get done. I don't have dust bunnies. I have dust cows. <laughs> and they blow like tumbleweeds through the living room. And then I'm just like, oh, so ashamed. And for years, I have tried all of the, like, you know, you get those, those like good housekeeping things where they're like, oh, you can just put this on your refrigerator and then you'll remember to do your vacuuming. Or, oh, you can just put this like into your phone and it'll set off an alarm when you need to do your vacuuming. And I'm like, yeah, it sets off my alarm when I'm driving my kid down to karate. Like, I can't vacuum them. So this year, my sister came to visit and we were shopping at the Bed Bath & Beyond when it was going out of business. 
And I looked at the Roomba, I was like, oh, I would love a Roomba, so cool. And then I kept walking and she went home and about a week later, the Roomba showed up. Because now, instead of muscling my way through a top-down solution of, okay, calendar reminder, oh, it went off at the wrong time, reset the reminder, and oh, maybe this time I didn't do it, but I'm gonna set it for tomorrow, and then tomorrow never comes. I just press the button. And then Roomba cleans my house. No solution. Just make it easy. It's the easy button from Staples. I don't have to be ashamed of my floor anymore. I don't have to lay on the floor trying to reach the back corner underneath the couch with the dust mop. I can just remember to do it. That can be went from a slog to a solution. So where are the pain points in your life where you're trying to force yourself into a top-down solution? The equine therapy website's uh, Stand in Balance reminds us that the first step to growth and change and evolution on any level is to be open to the options. When you look at your life through the lens of possibility, where do you feel stuck? Where do you feel you need more options? Bruce Dickinson said, life's too short to do the things you don't love doing. And I found that quote on one of those compilations of quotes in image search. And I was like, Bruce Dickinson, I typed him into our friend Google to figure out who he was. And I was expecting that he would be, I don't know, like one of the self-help gurus. No, actually he's lead singer of me. <laughs> Dickinson received his A-levels in English and history and economics. So that's like uh, getting amazing grades in Great Britain because he's British. He didn't know what he wanted to do. So he joined the army and then he decided that wasn't for him. So he went to university and studied at Queen Mary College in London. And at Queen Mary College, he got involved in the music scene. He was actually started out as a roadie. just the roadie for like they have all the different bands when they came to visit the school. He actually, um, so at, at that time he met some people and he didn't know how to even play the guitar yet, but he learned to play the guitar. He decided he loved music and he started writing his own lyrics. He got recruited into a band and then he tried out for another band and he got the lead singer position for that band. And at every step, he actually almost failed out of college because he got so involved in music. And then he figured out that he was going to fail and like, passed everything with perfect marks after writing, I think they said it was like eight months of essays in two weeks. <laughs> so he must've been brilliant. Um, but he never stopped looking for the next possibility, the next piece of his life to move him towards what he wanted to do. Dickinson's sentiment that time is too precious to squander on things that make you miserable was echoed by Noel in his interview on The Connection. And you know, I, I can't argue with that sentiment. We only have so much time on Earth. And as we get older, our days seem to move more and more quickly. If we have the capability to arrange our lives so that we can spend more time doing things we love and being with people we love, why wouldn't we do that? So this is my challenge to you on this beautiful May Day. That does not mark the beginning of any particular time that is recognized by the world at large. Make this day beginning for you. It's joyful and it's life affirming to plan your days so you can spend your time on delight rather than drudgery. May we all find a way to open ourselves to the possibility this day. Right, so if you would like to join me in singing another slightly difficult thing, <laughs> it's always slightly difficult. Thing. <laughs> this one is number. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I have to actually switch my stuff around before I can do it. Three, two, six, we're all the beauty we have now.
That one is tough because it has this gene that sounds like oh, that means something you know, and then you keep going like you know it, and you're like, wait, come in and you know, must be enjoy the coffee I'm drinking. Thank mm -hmm. you. 